Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the first edition of Oyster Global's LinkedIn Live. I'm Sandeep Sinha, co-founder and co-CEO of Oyster Global. Oyster is an institutional investor, and we invest in top tier uh, India's venture capital and private equity fund. Uh, the PEVC industry in India has contributed more than $200 billion in India over the past five years, and is expected to add another $600 billion in the next five years a massive, significant contribution to the growth trajectory of India. However, despite being such a terrific growth driver, the information about this industry is really, really tough to find. <clears throat> there is a amount of complexity. You know, we talk about terms like DV, DVPI, DVPI, DPI, freaks the hell out of a lot of intelligence. The performance benchmarks are not consistent. And finally, access to information is very, very limited. Today, we are picking this core challenge about the transparency in this industry or the lack of. And on this subject, I have a person who doesn't need much introduction in the world of venture capital, Karthik Reddy, co-founder and managing partner, Blue Venture. Karthik, pleasure to have you with us today. Yeah, thanks. Sorry about that small disturbance, Andy. Thanks for having me. No worries. No worries at all. So, Karthik, we are all very familiar with your love for adventure. You know, we keep hearing about your bungee jumping and snorkeling. I guess this is your love for adventure, which brings you to the world of uh, venture capital investing as well. Um, but, you know, the, the main conversation I wanted to have with you today is that uh, while the whole industry is still figuring out how to share information, um, how to bring more transparency, uh, you guys at Bloom have gone to the complete other end. Right. We have something that we have come across the whole the declassified information about the Omega files. And that's something that, you know, I really want to talk to you about today. But you know, before we get going on that thread, uh, one quick question. You know, this name almost sounds like, you know, a Netflix episode. Right. FBI declassified information uh, behind the scenes footage and things like that. So what what got you guys to come up with a name like the Omega Files and what's the whole intent behind the initiative? No, I think, uh, I mean, the, I mean there has to be some kick of putting in all the effort. So obviously you take some pleasure in coming up with a funky name and, and making, putting a, a little shroud of mystery around it and obviously inspired by 70s spy thrillers and, you know, <laughs> even when we launched it, we... We alluded to like sort of the equivalent of CIA and the FBI's declassifying documents, but I think you know in a more serious tone, that was my that was there were two things here, right? I never understood what the brouhaha about all the secrecy was beyond a point. So I I won't take as much credit as you're giving me on two three fronts. One is I think in the first four five years of a fund, it's very difficult to actually <clears throat> give any information that's meaningful. Right. And so whether it's a regulator, whether it's an investor, they, especially in an early stage fund, uh, and we're talking in the early stage domain because that's where we all belong. Very little happens. Like everything is uncertain. You know, a company that just because it raised Series A doesn't mean anything. It might just die the next morning. Right. And so you can go to town trying to disclose something, but we all know there is a large amount of ambiguity around the future of these young startups in the first five, six years. Right. But once that path, that, that point is crossed, typically things stabilize. Actually, for us in fund one, which we declassified, things didn't look stable even till year eight, year nine. And I think that was a function of how the ecosystem was back then, right? Mm -hmm. And so it was very difficult for us to talk about all, everything that we were going through. So I think the first seed of this happened almost five years ago, six years ago. We said, you know, we would love to share everything we went through but the timing was just not right. And so it had to be as close as possible to the end of life of the fund. Mm -hmm. So as much credit as you're giving us, it truly feels like a declassification of something that's already happened. And so uh, Omega, by the way, as I discovered from my research, was is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. So it was, it was right. to essentially signal that it's the finale of that alpha to Omega journey. And then we use a lot of Greek uh, to denote the kind of risk internal. So we have alpha, beta, sigma, etc. through some naming exercise from a few years ago. So this felt like a logical extension of that. Ergo, the declassification of the Omega files. Yeah. Very, very interesting. So 
Um, you know, at our end, that uh, oyster, the whole intent is that, you know, because we're looking at investing in the top tier funds, we are looking at standardization of information across each fund in terms of the performance, in terms of benchmarks and so on and on. But, you know, when we go through that exercise, you realize that there are multiple stakeholders for uh, the whole act of, uh, you know, making transparency as a core virtue. There are LPs, there are founders and so on and on. So when you look at this whole, um, you know, act of putting out the information and so on, how do you, what are the different dimensions that you try and take into account uh, while putting out a report like this? Yeah, I think that you've raised a very interesting point. So I think let's take one step back and think about uh, as much as you're trying to do your service as Oyster for your partners who can invest in the funds that you bring to them as an advisor. Um, the other person who worries about this the most in the country is our regulator. Though this is deemed to be a, a private contract between an investor and a fund manager like me, because it's in the realm of private. And, and if you put a ring fence that risk by saying only HNIs are accredited investors who can afford to put one or two or three crores into a fund are the ones who are entitled to take such crazy risk as venture capital, um, the regulators are still wary of, are they bad actors? Uh, is there bad behavior at a fund manager level? So let's just talk okay. about ourselves as an industry. So while entrepreneurs and, and team members and all of us have to be accountable as stakeholders, they're worried at the fund manager level. So one is to point to them that, hey, don't write, and this has been my favorite crib against all regulators, which is, don't write laws for the thieves, right? Write them for the success of the, the people who are trying to do the best that, they, best that they can. I'm not saying I knew five years ago that I would be successful or not, but I'm saying if I'm working hard at trying to make it successful, the enablement should be to me, not to disable the, the guys who are trying to cut a corner or two, right? So uh, I think this is an attempt to tell them that we are ready to be more transparent, ready to be more. Also, coincidentally, I'm, I'm still serving out the last three months of my two-year term as IVCA chair. And in the IVCA, if you see in the last four or five years, a lot of my predecessors did a lot of good work and said, let's be more transparent and have a benchmarking exercise done through Crystal, And now we do it through Prequin as well. So we submit data on a quarterly basis so that at least Crystal and Prequin have averages of what is the top decile, top quarter, and top 50% mark. So you will not have my fund level data, but you will, can see my data as an investor and say, where do I stack against 2018 AIF cat ones? Where do I stack against 2015 AIF cat ones? Which was not there before. So nobody had this data. The, the other stakeholder, I think you have to be responsible like in LPs is that a lot of us have semi-public money in India. Like the government has been a decent enabler of venture capitalists in India, homegrown. So while uh, Sequoia Matrix Axel don't touch Indian money, we all touch Indian money. And a lot of us have some proportion coming from taxpayers' money. Right. So when you, the minute you touch that and it's semi-public money, then we are in, invariably, you can hide, but you, you can't hide. You have to, you're accountable for that money. So basically, there's no running away from disclosing that. I won't be surprised if SIDB or someone says, I'm managing the government of India's money. I need all your performances. I'm going to put it on the public site. So it's, I think it's, so this is all the performance element of it. So actually right. what we did was not as radical because already steps are being put in place to say, hey, if you've performed and this is your IRR, this is your uh, MOIC, this is your DPI, whatever the measures of a success of a fund manager are, these are anyway being asked, we're all being asked to disclose this in one fa form or fashion. So this inevitably our LPC, etc. I think what was what we were trying to do is also talk to other stakeholders through something like an Omega Files. We're almost putting entrepreneurs on watch. I'm actually telling you should be afraid as an entrepreneur to take money from Bloom because someday I will put what you did for us in the public domain. Right? There's no get. I, I'm not. I'm not critiquing your efforts at all. Some of these journeys are 10 years and they might yield nothing. Right? I have a lot of respect for entrepreneurial journeys. Um, if you call them up and say this Karthik guy still supports us, despite us not returning, being a top five returner. That's very different from the fact that there's no hiding from the fact that you didn't make us any money, right? right. Whereas one guy made us 100 times the money. So both of you are going to get your place in the Omega Files. So I'm saying entrepreneurs should be wary about why are they touching institutional venture capital if they don't want to be accountable indirectly to my LPs and my regulators. That's why I introduced it with regulators and LPs. While there are primary stakeholders, it can't be that entrepreneurs say, that's not my problem. 
That's your problem, Karthik. It's, you know, well, I don't care who your investors are. I will do what I want with the money. And if I lose some money, you please put it in the write-off column, which is why you, VCs have like 60% write-off. So I want entrepreneurs to be cognizant of the fact how difficult it is to raise the money that we actually use to fund them, right? And, and I think when you take all of this collective behavior in the ecosystem, we'll build a very robust ecosystem. That's my dream, right? And, yeah. and that is, I'm trying to show guidelines and paths to various all stakeholders to try and do the very best that they can. That's all we're all doing, right? I, well, that's super helpful because, you know, if you create transparency all the way from an LP to a GP to an actual uh, founder and the rest of the organization that works for the founder, I think it builds a huge, you know, a huge bond of trust across. But, you know, one question um, that often gets brought up by founders is that um, the venture capital industry is very clinically brutal when it comes to, you know, selection or the survival of the fittest. But when yeah. you look at the report, um, it gives a very different perspective about the depth of the relationships that have been cultivated with the founders across over the number of years. Some of those who went through challenges and were supported at the right time, and then they resurface again as success, right? Do you want to shed a little bit of a light on that part of the journey that you've had with the founders? Yeah, I think, I think the, you know, the, I'll give an anecdote, which is interesting. Um, I remember about five years ago, six years ago, we had a person who was relatively new in the firm, right? And he said, uh, why are we giving respect to this? You know, why, we, why do we have all these logos on the walls? <clears throat> His, it was a logical question. You know why? Because in investor reporting, I had written down about 15, 20 of them to zero, right? So he's saying, these are zero and we don't even talk about them to other investors. So why are we putting them up on the wall? So my answer was, does he come to work every day? The answer is yes, in all 20 cases. And is he still committed to trying and making it work or she is trying to make it work? They don't know the answer, but I know the answer. And I'm answering for the entrepreneur and saying, yes, the answer is yes, right? And I'm not saying we should spend as much time with them because they're struggling. They don't want to meet you every month and give you their woes. They'll meet you once in six months. The hot company you can meet in once in six days if you want to, no problem. But you have to respect the fact that they are still at it in their entrepreneurial journey. And so you just leave them on the wall until they throw in the, they have, like, you know, they throw in the towel, right? Yes. And so when you, when you give them that amount of motivation and, and comfort that you're not penalizing them for this mark to market or valuation, but you're actually respecting their own, some of them get a second wind, right? Hmm. I'm telling you in one case, in, Exotel's case, it was a failed m and right? Part of which they attributed to the fact that they were not, it was not a very supportive cap table, right? So basically they said like, you know, they almost, they lost heart. They said, hey, we mm -hmm. should have actually got this m and done. Suddenly they got a second wind because I think there was enough of the cap table which said, you know, we believe in your ability to build much bigger, right? And no additional capital for another three, four years, they bootstrapped themselves into like a hundred plus crore revenue company. Right now, the thing about entrepreneurship is it's difficult to predict. If the entrepreneur mm -hmm. had said, I'll throw in the towel, here's your money. I'm selling this business for 20 crores. Take your money. You entered at eight crores. That was the exotel entry valuation. I made you two times your money. What are you going to say as an investor? You'll happily take two X the money and go home. Right? right. The fact that we made 20 X the money for all those people, you know, three years later is like now becoming history. So I think. If you see those curves, I think it, it shows you the resilience of what an entrepreneur needed in the non rara days of pre 2015. So you, you would have four or five year periods where nothing moved. Your valuation didn't move. Your revenue is inching up, but your valuation is not moving. You're not getting money. And so do you survive? Don't you is, is a function of how married to your mission you are. And I think we built character by saying this is this is entrepreneurship. This is reality and this is the norm. It's not the rule, right? And the, the, the exceptions are like far and few between. So you can get fooled by the exceptions and say all of them have to follow the, you know, the hot company getting hot valuations and hot rounds. Or you realize, no, no, that's the exception. The rest of them are going to run a certain, you know, uh, a way to uh, glory. And I think we got paid well because we kept that faith and I would say, you know, 100, 200 crores of DPI came from people who were left for dead in our portfolio. Right. In fact, um, Karthik, um, 
the way I've seen, I mean, you guys have actually taken it to the different level with the whole concept of continuity funds, where you figured yeah. out that the companies which need to be taken beyond the journey of a regular fund, you've been yeah. add, able to add incremental life beyond a particular fund's life. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because, you know, that's yeah. also mentioned in your reports yeah. about how you... Yeah. No, and, and, and it, it's too early uh, to, to talk about that. The end state of them, I would love to. I think three, four years down the line, the Omega files will break down the first continuity fund. So I'm already looking forward to it with excitement. I think that's half the reason we did the Omega files. Something to look forward to every few years. But basically, the 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 miracle of that first continuity fund was um, it's never been done in India before with domestic money. Right. Nobody has ever raised a continuity fund. Zero to hundred. All all money came from India in that fund, by the way. Um, mm. And uh, believe it or not, it came in the pandemic uh, with almost hundred percent coverage on Zoom. Right. So and we call it a miracle fund. Um, and we were oversubscribed by quite a bit. Right. So we targeted two twenty five crores to buy out six assets. We got three hundred and seventy five crores. All right. So we ended up actually playing primary capital in up rounds. So we got like a bounty. So we could actually play into Exotel and Purple and all of these companies in another round after transferring the asset. So where does that motivation come from? It's two, three parts. The fundamental belief is, can this asset still grow by 5x? Otherwise, why are you playing? Why are you wasting your money, investors' money, IRR, time to manage, the cost of managing this? This is all very, very high. If you don't believe that you're still going to compound at 25, 30%. Okay. So that's, that's yardstick number one, right? Otherwise, you just sell the asset and move on, right? And there are people, there are other investors who actually sold the asset, while we actually ro rotated it through, in like Zopper, which we've done through one of the continuity funds. Zopper, there is nobody in the cap table other than two founders in Bloom who are consistent from three years ago. Everybody else has been rotated out through secondaries, et cetera. We are the only guys who have actually rotated our position in, through a sec continuity fund. The second, I think, is a little bit of personal pride and personal greed, to be honest. You did 10 years of work. Company went from 2 million to 100 million. And you can see that it can be 400 million, 500 million. Why would I, and by the way, for doing one tenth of work, I'll be <laughs> blunt. Right? The company is at all settled, close to profitability, has a robust five person board. Four of them are new investors. They just bought in at 100 million. They going to do all the hard work. I'm going for the ride, right? Why would I leave that money on the table? It's a serious decision, in my humble opinion. So we found a hack. We basically said the right way to do this is through the continuity fund. It worked for us. We got subscribed. And touch wood, we had a great partner in Evindis. Um, and they got us a lot of that capital. So you need somebody who had, who had that belief. And, and uh, lo and behold, uh, Indian investors love this kind of stuff. Because essentially, it's a shorter life fund. It's right. a known, discovered portfolio. We gave... Uh, discounts on you know fees and uh, carry economics right the cost of that fund is lower because you don't run a 10 year fund the costs are usually annualized right so you're only running a five year fund so basically it's a very efficient vehicle theoretically some of them will might actually get a net irr better than that of the core fund because right. the core fund took a lot of slog to get there whereas the the continuity fund was well primed for the the growth and by the way despite the slowdown Fund one's continuity candidates are probably the most robust companies in my entire portfolio because they figured out how to be profitable with very little money before we moved in there. Right, right. So none and of them are at risk. Yeah. None of them are at risk. They have enough capital. They have enough proximity to profitability. None of them is going to die even if you take an axe to them. Right. And obviously, in absolute terms, this capital return is probably going to be the most uh, generous returns that come in the final years. Yeah, no, and, and that's what I, the, you know, um, Gaurav of Avindis jokingly told me, I've, I've figured out a way to get, make you guys a lot more carry than you would have made in your <laughs> I, said, I said, I have to give you credit, but uh, yeah, I think they were great partners, but uh, now it's not done, done. I have another three, four years of work, but right. all, all touch wood, all the companies are looking robust. So we'll hopefully get a good outcome from them. And I think the beauty, I, I, I'll tell you upfront, right, a sneak preview to your listeners today. The beauty of that continuity fund is that however low the probability, it gives me the chance of making a mega statement that in a 15, 16 year period, 
the companies that I backed in 2011 to 13 are not 5x and not 3x in the continuity fund, but 15x in totality. Wow. Right. And if I can <clears throat> say that, then for the first time we show double digit DPI in India, then you can tell the Americans boss it can happen in India as well. Right. right. Don't keep trashing us that it can't happen in India. We, it's just a matter of you got us at the wrong time. You got us in a weak ecosystem. And then you complain that it was not happening for a decade. We take all the criticism, but we, our time has come. We can actually, you know, multiply money that much. Right. And I would love to be able to say that. I wouldn't have had the opportunity to say that if I'd sold all the assets and I'm just sitting on the bylines, which I've been forced to do because of so much regulatory pressure and LP pressure. I sold D2E right. networks. That bloody stock has gone up six times since I've sold it. <laughs> so do you I think that? I left some 50-70 crores on the table, like 0.5 to 0.7 DPI. Can you imagine? Wow. On the table. Wow. It's it's silly. And what, in what on the seven-month play, play? So I think everybody's in an, urgent, in an urgency to get their capital back. And sadly, in venture, it takes time. So I engineered some of that taking time through a continuity. And by the way, everybody had the right to reinvest. Only 30,000 chose to. So the people right. who reinvest will actually see that 15x gain on that one crore. That's what I'm going to be proud of. Absolutely. So but do you think, uh, Karthik, that with this kind of a continuity funds coming into play, uh, there is a direction towards permanent capital, which, you know, might come about? In, I would love to. Maturing? Yeah. Yeah, it's my, it's my dream uh, construct, but it's not easy. And there's not too many people who have <clears throat> the depth of pockets to leave permanent capital with a manager, number one. Number two, until you actually return that kind of capital, Sandeep, I don't blame investors to say, yes, I'm not giving you permanent capital. So I think permanent capital is a element of an ecosystem where somebody is collectively, let us say 10 people want to give permanent capital to you or me at Bloom, right? Or uh, And they've given us money. And over 10, 15 years, you've taken their 100 crores and you made it 500 crores. They're very happy with you. Okay. Right. So they say even adjusted for any other alternative asset, uh, alternative use of this capital, I've still made a lot of money, even after adjusting for carry, after adjusting for 10, 12%, you know, stock market like index returns. So this additional 100, 200 crores is like surplus. I'm going to park it with, you know, Karthik and team at Bloom and not worry about when it comes back, as long as they figured out in every five, seven years that they will give me back my principal at least. Right. That is the nature of perpetual capital as I understand it from a very first principles basis. Right. I'm too young right. in my fund history and life to go and even have this conversation with a lot of institutional players. So I'm not going to try it anytime soon. I think the magic bullet in, in venture, the magic moment in venture or any uh, PE venture is that when you're returning capital at an equal or faster pace than you're drawing down capital. So we are all very far from that because we are also grown in fund size. So while I gave back 500 odd crores or 600 crores at this juncture, the problem is I've now gone and raised 2000 crores. So by the time I return that money, it's going to be another eight, 10 years. So until you find a stability in the cycle where you're giving back a lot of money every year, which is still for me, six, seven years away, you can't, right. you don't have a model right to go and ask for perpetuity capital is my take. The, the significant growth of your ecosystem in some sense becomes the the reason for not being able to do so. Yeah. So I think as long as you're delivering, people will give. You need to live with that for a little longer. Unfortunately, on our business, a little longer means five years, six years, seven years right. at a time. So we have to be patient about that. And Kathak, one of the big shifts that at least I'm seeing is that, you know, when we discuss uh, in our investment committees, um, the yeah. decision to be able to invest in a particular fund, unlike yeah. ever before, the focus on DPI has gone up very significantly. How yeah. much liquidity a fund has been able to return uh, to yeah. their elements? And you know, sometimes there is a there is a debate saying that um, in terms of uh, the long term value creation versus the need to get to a faster DPI, there is usually yeah. a bit of a trade off that happens where you may have to let go of some of your assets to increase the DPI, which you may would have wanted to hold on for a longer period of time. So how, yeah. how do you guys really see that trend of a trade-off between the DPI versus the long-term returns? Um, it's a really tough one. I, I feel uh, I don't have advice for 
myself or the managers as much as what I've done, you can see, right? I've engineered some yes. of that ability to roll, roll over through a secondary fund. Yes. Uh, where I could sell uh, in the public markets, I sold E2E and in Folium. They were small portions, but still, I would say 35-40% of DPI. So uh, my advice in general is that DPI is generally going to be broken for you in about four components. I'll, I'll explain that. There is early natural m and that happens in every portfolio. Okay? Mm -hmm. You can call it distress sale. You can call it... Um, you can call it... Uh, um, you know, strategic sale, trade sale, whatever. There's a very natural process about to which about five, eight, ten companies in a portfolio get sold and give your capital back or so. Some give two x, some give three x, some give five x, but it's in a very small percentage of the fund. So, a kul milake apka thirty, forty, fifty percent DPI ho sakta. So, zyada nahi ho sakta. By the sixth, seventh year. By the sixth, seventh year, people want to see some part of their capital come back, right? So this is the only natural DPI that you can generate and because nothing else is broken out typically to massive scale yet that you're able to get secondary purchases done. Then right. come the first chances of secondary purchases come when you cross a half a billion or a billion. I'm talking about an institutional manager. I'm not talking about angel investors who can sell much earlier. You have too much stake. I don't think you can sell that selling that one, two percent sometimes doesn't make a dent at all. So, you know, whether it's Fireside or Stellar is selling in Mama Earth or Port or uh, they were all meaningful chunks for that size of a fund. In our mm. first fund, our challenge was it took a long time for a company to hit 200 million, 500 million. So even if I could have sold, I wouldn't have made enough money at 20, 30, 50 million. So it has to be a, a chunk. I would uh, suggest that if it's not, if the sale is not generating 5, 10% DPI on the fund, it's a, I, I'm not a fan of selling. It's useless, right? right? Uh, if one or two positions can somehow fundamentally give you uh, you sell 50% of a position and get to 1x DPI, I think it's great signaling to show that you're willing to sacrifice in the short term for, to invest for the long term, right? So then people say, oh, these guys are willing to show us that they can make money and give us back money. It's a muscle that we appreciate, so we should give them more money because they, they, they have the discipline to be able to sell if it comes to it. That's what some LPs are looking for. Um, and then comes the two big things, right, which is, you know, it crosses the unicorn mark, it either goes public or if there's a big M&A, then you get a lot of lot of DPI potentially or ability to liquidate. And around that mark is when the stock is hottest and various people want to buy your stake out. So it's much more easy to liquidate and get big chunks of capital. So I think you should budget in this fashion, but ideally shoot for the idea that you're at least trying to get as close to all the capital back in the investor's pocket as quickly as possible. There's no perfect rule of thumb here, but somewhere between the seventh, eighth, ninth year, if you can give all the capital back, then people allow you to breathe easy. Then when you reach the 10th yeah. year, hopefully you're giving at least half of your MOIC back because people are saying, boss, it's been 10 years. You're not all going to give it to me magically at the end of the 12th year. So then start giving me, showing me that you can at least sell half of it. Right. And so that's kind of what I anticipate is your DPI path. I don't think you can, you have so much in control of it as you think you are. So this is the best right. case, I think. Yeah. No, very fair, very fair. <clears throat> so I think the other side about the whole maturity of industry, um, in the Crystal report we just recently published, we realized that there are at least 44 general partners who are successively raising either their third or fourth or a later on fund. Hmm. So when you look at the ecosystem today with at least 44 GPs on third plus fund, um, the conversation that usually comes up globally that the VCP ecosystem in India doesn't have sufficient depth as of now. What's your yeah. take? You know, I mean, do you think we are getting there or how far are we from being able to, you know, actually take a claim saying that, you know, we have enough depth into the whole entrepreneurial VCP ecosystem in India? No, no, I, I don't think I'm naive enough to say we have depth. Um, we don't, I think. So I'm on that camp, actually. Uh, primarily because I think the market is very vast, number one. Uh, so there's way too much entrepreneurial activity. And what happens is every manager, because you don't have uh, a deep enough track record, even amongst second time, third time, as you rightly pointed out, fund sizes are very small. So you have to calibrate risk basis your fund size. You can't suddenly, because you're a third time manager, you can't be writing a $5 million check if you have a $70 million fund, right? So it's way too much risk for early stage, unless you're a mid-market PE guy. So let's talk about venture, right? So, and maybe some of the guys you're speaking about are mid-market PE and they're being wrongly classified. But if venture is taking very early stage risk, 
the reality is per company risk sadly stays between half a million to one and a half to three million for a lot of the domestic managers right it's taken us a 250 plus million dollar fund for the first time to calibrate our check sizes beyond two and a half three million till 2021 december sandeep the biggest starting check bloom ever wrote was 2.1 million dollars wow yeah so it takes a long time to have that courage to be able to write large checks because you don't have you we need money for reserves because we're playing early stage now what okay. happens is like if you have small funds it's not about number of funds or the number of vintages you're running but the funds are small then you're dependent on the a ecosystem yeah. the b ecosystem to be the folks who take your companies forward and there i would sadly say there is not as much depth as we need right because there the bar is very high and a lot of things trickle to a slowdown which is exactly what we saw in our fund one nobody would back these companies so if they miraculously survived they survived otherwise they would die right and now what are we doing we took a funnel in 2012 which was shaped this way and we have started expanding it this way then in 1415 there was a little bit of an expansion in the a if you follow the bottom of my hand and now that is constrained it's not like you're getting dozens of new players at series a but all the new managers are adding are doing this to the funnel <laughs> right so the choke points are not going to go away and so yeah. the bar is very high and then for this to become <clears throat> a uh, a rapid uh, sort of uh, source of dpi and 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 cleansing of the ecosystem you need an active small ticket mnda ecosystem which we're also not very good at correct so when you talk about maturity it's, it's all of these layers and the mm. you say you look at the us market even in a bull market it looks good even a bear market even that doesn't look good they're just shuttering and moving on right right but they can afford to absorb these losses in this part of that funnel because the ones that tweak through some of them become 100 billion dollar companies okay. or 50 okay. billion dollar companies or 40 billion or 10 billion in india there are not too many to count in that territory mm. so you can't imagine that all these losses will be you know paid off very easily so i think the model is therefore forcing us to think about how can we create more sustainable companies at a little more a little smaller scale than wait to try and take everything to like unicorns right and so the depth of the market or the relative lack of maturity or depth of the market has to be compensated by how do you exit smaller right more meaningfully and which is why okay. i'm publicly a huge advocate of small and mid cap ipos i'm not a believer in a post in the con ipo that i think is a rarefied air 50 companies will do it but that's not what's going to build india's tech ecosystem for the thousands of checks that have been written over the years right so 50 companies are not going to save us so how are the others going to get saved what magic is going to happen where are the cash mnas where are the secondaries in a 200 million dollar company there's nothing right so i think that depth is not going to come easily it's all it's a very slow like churning cycle uh, it will come only when we see value being accreted out of an mnda and we see value from mid sized uh, ipos which are thankfully beginning to happen like idea forge was a great story last year you right. see more of those come right traction went public and you know abhishek goel is very happy uh, abhishek and neha at 1000 crore market cap and they're building away they're profitable like good old like good old fashioned building so nothing wrong with it everybody made money everybody is continuing to make money what's the problem so i think we have to shift the mindset a little to that rather than depending on venture to suddenly change shape and then the funnel becoming sexier by the day it's not going to happen and i think the more people will see liquidity um, through these events i think the attractiveness of a lot of people to kind of start investing in this asset class would also change right i mean uh, right. that is true that is true you know i saw um, you know you again the details of the fund one that you published was a largely domestic raised fund and yeah, yeah. that has been a very interesting takeaway because you know over a number of years uh, the dependence of the top tier funds on the global capital is much higher yeah whereas if you look at the listed markets now they are fully sustained uh, or largely sustained by the capital from the that's from it. the domestic investor right that's so right. Uh, that's it's it's ironical that you know in terms of saying the while the domestic wealth is growing massively there are more and more high net worth individuals being created in the country on a daily basis yeah yet the participation of um, you know uh, such investors in this asset class is very very limited yeah and that's because of access of information or the unitization yeah. and so on 
What is your view of, um, you know, the way domestic capital pool is shaping up uh, and the potential no. that, you know, fund in this asset class? No, that's exactly, I think the, the files are, episode one is like the first step towards that. I mean, all of you should, everybody in the industry should take the cue that, hey, you have to have the courage to disclose. Otherwise, you're never going to win over this audience, number one. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because the international institution LPs know how to read like your deck, right? They know how to dissect your deck. Therefore, but sadly, as you said, there the competition is global, right? Right. In some sense, the Indian investor can't invest in anybody other than their desi fellow. And yes. for us, we are here, so that's the best source of money. So we both have to figure out how to get the equilibrium to work. But you're absolutely right that we have not given enough comfort that this money is going to come back in spades and going to make a decent IRR, right? So to you know this, I know this the amount of Indian money into AIFs, just cat one, cat two, has exploded in the last five, six years, right? So maybe it took a slowdown in the last 18 months, but it, it grew like 10x before from the 2012 to 18 era. Uh, if you take that was X, the 18 to 22 was 10x. That's what I've heard from many sources. So I can't, I can't see it grow any faster than that until money starts coming back. It goes back to your question from 15 minutes ago. DPI nahi dikha hoge, paisa ke paise ke se you can't have Bilkul. people going on allocating. Which is why I'm saying that if you think of logically connecting what you said about public markets and private markets, there is an answer there. I'll tell you the right. answer. The answer is you cannot disclose everything about every company mid course. But the best of those companies can start going public. Right? When they go public, the amount of domestic demand there is for a profitable tech stock today in the country is at an all time high, the, right? right? You're not delivering enough, you're not supplying enough good shit, right? So that, whose problem is that? Us as an industry, right? Because yeah. you've not actually educated the founders to start becoming profitable and take them public. You're saying, no, 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 it's a very scary proposition. No, it's not, right? Companies were meant to build for 20, 30 years. All DCL right. formula, uh, talk about posterity for the company, right? The terminal value is calculated as if the company lives for infinity. Not for four years, not for three years, right? So if you want to believe DCF and valuations and et cetera, then you build towards a long sustainable company. You don't have to be CEO. You can design as founder, yeah. you can hire top talent. But what mindset is not So the first time you see it, last two, three years. Before that, you couldn't count off the number of IPOs you couldn't count off the number of IPOs in more than two hands. It's embarrassing, right? So now if you don't build that culture and you don't start returning money, when you start doing that, that money will say, I got a slice of the tech pie at $250 million mm. valuation. And I can write that to a billion. I don't need Sandeep or Karthik to give me that $250 to a billion dollar ride. Then they make money on tech. They give back the money to the early stage managers. right? And as an early stage manager, you have ridden that tech wave and made some money and given back DPI to the NP as well. So this virtuous cycle has to kick in. You can't sit there and bitch that they're not giving you money. Now, here's the good news, right? Like if you look at wealth creation, if we truly believe we're getting from a $3 trillion plus economy to a $10 trillion economy, all empirical evidence from China and US indicates that the amount of wealth pool that gets created, because sadly, a lot of this discretionary income and wealth gets created in the top end of the pool. It's not like, you know, my poor driver is suddenly investing tens of lakhs into the market, right? It stays concentrated right. as wealth. That wealth is looking for outlets. It will look for outlets. And the wealth grows disproportionately relative to the GDP growth. So somebody pointed this out. In the US, when things grew from 3 to 10, 10 trillion, wealth under management grew from half a trillion to five, five and a half trillion. Correct. Right? So kya karega itna paisa? So it's waiting. Right. It's saying, show me how you guys make money. I'll give you more. Right. So the onus is on us. It's not on them, if you ask me. Yeah, and you know, so, so, from a domestic lot of funds guys. are the only guys who can get their money, sir. So yeah. it's ours to lose, right? Yeah. Domestic <laughs> IPOs are the only things that can get their money. It's ours to lose. Okay. So you build great tech companies, both of us are going to win, the entrepreneurs and the fund managers. Yeah. You know, it's it's interesting, uh, Karthik, just yesterday night I was on a call with a global fund manager and they were starting to ask questions saying, how can we raise money in India? So I think the fact... <laughs> So yeah, yeah, the fact that there is a, a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. yeah, is huge. 
So no, super helpful answers, Karthik. But I can't let you go before answering a couple of questions for the some of the entrepreneurs who are dialed into the session right now. So you'll have to pardon me, but I'm going to ask you some of your usual cliched questions, saying that you know sure, if you're sure. engaging with a lot of the entrepreneurs right now, um, uh, especially you know the ones who are dialed in for the session right now. Um, are there any couple of sectors that you are particularly more bullish about? Are there any couple of trends that you want to leave a message with? Um, you know, some uh, of the guys who are businesses. Yeah, I think I think see, I think. I can only speak about what we vote within the firm, and I think we are we continue to be bullish on energy transition, as like a subset of which is electric and solar, etc. We don't see how we get more vantage uh, points against the sort of fossil fuel uh, economies of the world if we don't build that. So I think there's going to be continue to be a strong push towards that over the next ten years. So anything which fuels that, we love. But there's not too much of that which can be played with very small venture capital. But um, we we like that space. Then you know we've always been fans of deep tech. If you look at the Omega version one, the two biggest winners are deep tech. So we always look for anything which is commercially scalable globally in deep tech, right? And so it's not an easy bar. So it's not like I find dozens every every vintage. But you know the far and few between, we've looked at a whole bunch of stuff in life sciences. Uh, last fund, I think we did a whole bunch in manufacturing, which are finally shaping up now. So the gestation periods are longer, but we we generally love these two parts. In SaaS, I think um, it's a tougher and tougher market, and I don't think you can build kick-ass global SaaS without a lot of uh, AI embedded into it. Right. Now. So for me, AI and SaaS are merged in the sense that there a lot of it is going to be embedded um, AI into into enterprise software. I think that's where the biggest applications are going to come. In consumer, you're not going to see them as a standalone AI play. I think you'll see them as always an application play. Uh, so Spotify might do the best music AI in the world, not some other company, right? Um, so I think the vantage points are lesser because the data sets are with the incumbents, right? So while there's a lot of buzz around AI, I'm more more excited about AI's enterprise applications rather than consumer. Um, this is on the on the sort of core tech side, which is what most people think VCs do. And then there's the Danda businesses, which I still feel India, if we have to really outshine in the next 10, 20 years, we got to upskill. I'm still an edtech bull. Uh, I, I think there are spots there that uh, to sort of secure our workforce in terms of upskilling, et cetera, I think is a huge area uh, that I would bet on. And I don't think in any era where we are growing at six, eight percent, I don't think fintech is ever not a great option, right? So there'll always be areas of fintech. You have to be careful there on playing the regulatory card and playing that point. But basically, you find a founder who can take a regulatory you know, path to build a sort of a moat and then build an interesting business on top of that. Eventually, everybody becomes HDFC bank, right? So <laughs> even a housing finance company becomes a bank. So my point is, you, you can't avoid that path. But I think if you have the courage to follow building really big, I think a lot of fintech is interesting, including the rails. Um, these are these are a big ones, and then we stayed away from brands for a long time. But it looks like if per capita GDP is going to go off the charts, then you know conspicuous consumption on the higher end of the you know spectrum uh, is going to take off, right? And so, interestingly, in the after many many years, I'm looking at you know uh, roti and kapra as startups. Right. No Makan ones yet, but you know, <laughs> it's taken like a decade of watching, but we actually have two, three in our pipeline. So I think we're going a full circle because the the there's a step function evolution of the consumer now that's happening. So anything in that similarly in entertainment, there's a new step function and uh, you know, we have an investment in stage, which is a you know uh, OTT. But it's very difficult to talk to entrepreneurs after we've made the bets because you know we've already mm -hmm. made our bets. Um, in, in new stuff, yeah, I think you should. I think everyone's working on new thesis areas this year. But keep watching. We do publish our thesis areas, and that's where we probably have the most faith to add portfolio. Right, and just one more cut on the founders side. I think yes. uh, when I looked at your uh, Omega reports, you had done some analysis in terms of you know the some of the founders who come from a top tier institute versus you know those yeah. who may not necessarily be the one. And I think yeah. there was a big disparity in terms of participation versus gross returns. Uh, do you want to just yeah. touch upon that? Then? 
Yeah, I don't know where the biases are. I wouldn't overread into that data. I had to present it to be loyal and faithful to the data. Uh, but as you can see, the we tried to be democratic, but the Series A, B universe wasn't very democratic. <laughs> they focused on the pedigrees. So, you know, it's a chicken and egg problem, right? If you don't fund the companies, how do you know they would have not done well or done well? So, yeah. I don't know if it's a if it's a leading bias or a trailing bias. But Understood. with that, of course, clearly a lot of the winning dollars are sitting with these, you know, graduates of these elite colleges. There's no taking away from it. I'm presenting data. I don't have a viewpoint. If you look at my bets, right. I've actually been very democratic. Only 30, 40 percent yes. of my bets are in these pedigree uh, founders, right? So I think, I, to be honest, we haven't gone and done that analysis in fund two and fund three. I will present it because I've started a, about three, four years from now, right? I don't want to create uh, too many unnecessary biases too early because we don't know the outcomes. So, you know, yeah. as much as I love a certain company, if it fails suddenly, then it, it fails the test. I can't present that data just because I picked on them right now. So only end states matter. That's the harsh truth of the Omega files, right? So, you know, all the stories are valuable, but uh, to the most of the constituents, the final story can only be told through winner's eyes, which is the harsh yeah. truth of humanity. Yeah. But yeah, I was actually quite delighted to see the widespread and the fact that, yeah. you know, uh, the role of the institution played only for, let's say, 35% of the founders. So 65% of the founders are actually coming from not necessarily the top tier institute. So it was a good to see the diversity, at, at least in terms of the participation across the board. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I think we continue to see that. I, I'm hoping they, that myth also gets kind of broken and we don't have a situation where these biases are too deep. Oh, excellent. Thank you so much, Karthik. Lovely speaking to you. And uh, I genuinely hope the Omega file sets a new benchmark for the level of access, transparency, information sharing for the industry. And we would all be looking forward to the next release very soon. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Sandeep. Take care. Bye-bye. Have a good one. Really Bye. Thank you, everybody, for participating in the session this evening. Take care and have a great evening ahead.